evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our online lecture. Today, Masa proudly presents to you the Malaysian Architecture Education Online Lecture Series. No matter where you are, I hope you are well. My name is Vinci Lai Kaying, and I'm a Masa representative. I'll be your moderator for today. For those who do not know what Masa is, I hope you can lend me your ears as I explain further. Masa stands for Malaysian Architecture Student Alliance and is a non-profit student committee operating directly under Putubaha Architect Malaysia or PEM. We consist of student representatives from all architecture institutes in Malaysia. It's a platform where Malaysian architecture students join forces to learn and share with the appreciation of the past, generating sustainable living in the present, and bringing unlimited possibilities to the future. Our mission is to develop an effective platform and network between Malaysia architecture students and professionals. We also serve as a liaison between students and PEM. We represent the voices from architecture students, and this is what we are. Now, let us greet our special guest for today. We present to you Nashmi, who will be talking to us on the topic, Finding Those Lost Hour. Nashmi has always been passionate toward design. He entered architecture following his father's advice that architecture is the mother of design with the hope that he could pursue all his interests under one roof. When he is not doing design studio work, he can be found running his freelance branding design business, designing t-shirt and jersey, emceeing for event, or simply being immersed in a good book alone in his home. The title of the talk is Finding Those Lost Hour. So pulling out all crazy all-nighters is synonymous with architecture students. It's the one thing that seniors and sometimes lecturers always boast about upon entering this field. But what if that doesn't have to be the case? And what if you can simultaneously have a good night's sleep and pass your classes and still have time for other things? In this talk, the speaker will share about his journey, tinkering his daily routine, in an effort to regain control of this one invaluable, unstoppable force, time. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section, and we will try to answer them during the Q&A session at the end of the talk. And without further ado, let's welcome Nashmi. Hi, Nashmi. How are you today? Hi, Vinci. I'm good. Thank you. OK, so that's great. I will pass the floor to you now. So, hi everyone. My name is Najmi Zestizar. So today's session will be quite chill. So it's mostly be, will be consisting of my voice and some pictures. So if you have to do something else whilst listening to this, then it's totally okay. It's like listening to a podcast or something like that. So back to the topic at hand, finding those lost hours. Where's the space bar? Oh. I believe that time is space. It's a space to think, uh, reflect, take action and change. So when Masa asked me, approached me for a talk, I, it took me a few days to reply because I wanted to share something that would reflect that, which is time. And the way I thought about it was that there are many things that I could have shared about, uh, namely my design process, my overall outlook on design, or even the projects I've been involved in in the past few years. But in the end, I decided to go on to share something that's much closer to my heart. And at the same time, something that is, uh, that probably has more value to people hearing it. So 2020, specifically this year, well, last year, is the year that made the most difference to me. Because why? The whole COVID situation going on, it forced us, well, all of us to live inside. And it gave me, and a lot of us as well, a lot of time to reflect on our lives. I had questions like, 
is this it? Will I spend the rest of my life like this? Am I comfortable with myself? This version of me right now, do I like him? All of these existential questions, how does it relate to my topic today? Well, it began from my desire to, ch my, my desire wanting to change. But, but why? Why, why, would you, why would you want to change? Well, if you go on social media nowadays, you, you'll have tons and tons of posts that, that, that tells you to be yourself and all of that. And, and that's good. That's okay. But which part of yourself should you accentuate, improve, or even change? This topic, it came from the realization that uh, the way that I do things right now, it cannot possibly accommodate the life that I want to be or the person that I want to be in the future. So what was the way that I did things? So this is before. So I am pretty sure a lot of us is still in this position because even before entering architecture, we are told about this studio life that we're about to be sucked into, which is no sleep. Ooh. And even if there's any sleep, then it would probably be during other classes. And last, and last but not least, an extremely intense workload. Things that for other courses, it might take like a week or so, but for us, we had to send it the next day. And I get this. Romanticizing this whole thing is part of the fun. As, as, we, as, as we architecture students would like to say, architecture. It's, it's this thing that we're so obsessed about. And, and I get it as well. It, it's, it's fun to tell, uh, to tell other courses that this one architecture course is the one course that, that rules it all. But then again, all of the other, other courses would like to say the same thing. Oh, we have the hardest course. No, we don't have to know. It's, it's, it's the usual thing for each of the other courses. But the harmful part, however, is that we romanticize this, 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 this practice so much that we apply it into our life, in my case, my life, so much without thinking of the hidden effects, which is one, the lack of rest or sleep. Second, uh, I neglect other stuff like my family, uh, my health, even, I, I, even my exercise. And we have this non-ending tunnel of stress because the, the work that you do, it's, it's always, uh, you have a lot of work you have to do during a short period of time. So you have this very, very, very long tunnel of stress. So what do I mean by all of these? Well, a lot of us, we tend to blindly We tend to blindly follow these habits because without realizing what's the real message our body is telling us. I am thirsty. Speaking takes a lot. We need to sleep at night. As architecture students, we test our strength of our architecture studentness by seeing how long we can stay up for. And one thing that I realize is that we are actually falling under this illusion that we're going to be young forever. I mean, that's what we all think most of the time. This staying up culture 
feels awesome now. And it feels like we're almost invincible because our bodies right now, it heals as fast as we tear. So that 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 gap of of being in the downtime in between, you don't really feel it. But to me, I, I keep thinking about, but what about when we're older? You know, the times when we've uh, graduated and when we've gone into our separate paths. Uh, this is the thing that I like to highlight regarding the staying up culture in relation to the kind of life I want to be living and the person that I want to be in the future. The way that we're living in right now, is it sustainable? Sure, our youth right now, like us being, us architecture students right now, being young makes it very easy. But the way that we're doing things right now, when we're older, what about then? Because these habits, it adds up. And to me, this, this, this realization came early because as a little kid, I've always had lower immunity than the rest of my siblings. Uh, meaning that I am more prone to getting sickness than the rest of my younger brothers and sisters because I am the oldest out of all. So if I, if I were to have like lack of sleep or even some dust in the house or even just being too overworked, it can cause me to fall sick for, for about a few weeks on the end. And this too became apparent to me during studio because uh, I was also hooked up into the culture of staying up all night. So much so that um, actually during the first project of the first semester, my first year in UPM, we had already applied for 24 hours, for our studio. Like, I think the rest of my classmates really wanted the time to do that work. But for me specifically, I only followed because I wanted to be the part of that life because of how romanticized it is. I, I decided, okay, I want to do it for 24 hours just because. And this is harmful because I neglected the messages that my body, that my body is telling me, which is, well, this is not how it's supposed to be. I, most of us, we procrastinate and we claim that we're more active at night to do our work so we can stay up. I do believe that uh, a majority of us, in fact, are more active at night. But I think that this must be changed because our body clock, our body clocks needs to be changed from being late night workers to early morning rises. Now, I'm not going to fear monger you by telling all of these things about the detrimental effects of staying up late, but I'm sure all of you know yourselves how are you, what kind of effect the staying up culture is, is, is affecting your own body. The usual routine, I'll, I'll tell you the usual routine. Usually for architecture students, the usual, our day, it begins at 12 a.m. So the first few hours, we feel that, that, that we're active but by the time it reaches about 2 or 3 a.m., uh, our productivity starts to decline. And then so you start uh, recharging with coffee. And then you gain about another uh, hour or so of productive time until about 5 a.m., maximum 6. And then out of nowhere, we wake up, get this, we wake up, but not remember when we slept. Remember that time? And you look at your watch, it's already 10. So when this happens, usually, uh, if you have class during this time, like probably, like even, even in my case, you probably decide, should I 
skip or should I not skip? But usually, it usually depends on whether or not do I have any balance on absence, absence class. You know, you know, you know how it is. Like maximum two, 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 twice. I think twice or three times you can skip. So by this time, you you start going to your classes and you start falling asleep in those classes. The routine goes by. Uh, in a blur and by the time you look at your watch again it's only 4 p.m and then by that time you start getting hungry you take lunch you go on to have some food by the time you finish eating you go back to your room you just feel like you just want i'm just going to sit down i'm going to sit down on my bed or i'm going to sit on my chair but da 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 Yet again, you wake up not remembering how you slept or when you slept. And you look at your watch, it's already 7 or 8 p.m. And you also realize that you have a lot of work due soon. So you start getting that, your, your, your panic starts rising in and then you realize, okay, I have work to do. And then you message your friend, bro, bro, let, let me see your progress. And then Usually what they say is, yeah, hey, I could not start like you, or I haven't started yet. And then the, you start getting relief because you're not the only one who hasn't finished your work. And then you spend the next few hours, you know, when, when you wake up and then when you, you've, especially when you've slept a lot, you, you have this mentally buffering you know, when, when, you know, when, you know when, when YouTube loads, that, that, that happens to you as well when you sleep too much and then you wake up. So you take quite some time to wake up again. And then uh, by the time it's about eight, so now during nine, from nine to about 11, you're prepping your workstation again so you can start working at 12 again and the process repeats. I am now thirsty again. So this was my usual routine back in the day. During the first few, few weeks, uh, it was the way to go because to me it works. And the thing with things that work is that we keep repeating it because if it's not broken, then why replace it, you know? But in my case, my body couldn't really keep up after a few weeks because I start feeling that decline. I start feeling my, my immunity not, not working as much as, as it could be. So uh, before I would be able to stay up until four or five now, like not now, but like before, like during that time, by the time it reaches like about 3 a.m., my body would start to feel off already. I, I would feel, um, I'm starting to get sick. And this is also the time that I start to realize that my, my tonsillitis, my, my throat, come in handy because uh, this, whenever it swells, it's an indication to me that I'm starting to get sick. So when this happens, it, sig it, sig it signals to me that I need to stop my work. I need to rest. I need to uh, stop, whatever the work, stop whatever work that I'm doing and take rest, uh, drink water, get some sleep. So it becomes my indication of resting. Lah. So it, it, it becomes like if my tonsil swells, then I need to rest. Oh, before that, I have uh, something else to share, which is ba -ba -da -ba, my mantra back in the day, which is called sprint the tortoise. So this was a mindset 
that I adopted back in my second semester during my first year. So this mindset uh, emerged when I realized that the way that I'm doing my work is not really cutting it. And it's not, it's not, it's not exactly sustainable for me following everybody's from following everybody else's style. So Sprint the Tortoise is actually derived from the story of the uh, tortoise and their hair. Vincy, are you aware of that story? Yes, yes, yes. I read about it before. It's like my childhood story. <laughs> so you know what happens in the story, right? So yeah. there, uh, there's the rabbit and the tortoise. It goes in a race in the forest, but the tortoise is slow whilst the rabbit is very fast. And the thing about the rabbit is that the rabbit is arrogant about his speech, so much so that in the middle of the race, he decided, oh, I'm going to take a nap because he's that arrogant. He knows that the tortoise will never catch up to him. And so lo and behold, the rabbit slept and the tortoise won the race. So this, this mindset made me imagine that what if I am the tortoise and the rest of my classmates are the rabbit. My classmates have, I imagine them having all of these uh, advantages that would make like if they were to work for one day, that worth of work for me, I have to work for three days. I imagine myself like that. So that if I were to work, I have to work. If I were to match their effort, then I have to work much harder. And, and this is because I notice whenever for studio work, I'm usually the first one to start, but I'm also the one that's always last to finish. So this mindset, it, it led me to stay back at the studio until everyone has gone back home. Uh, and I would only go back to my hostel to take a bath and sleep uh, after the studio closes at night, which is at 11 p.m. But then by 11 a.m. tomorrow morning, I'll, I'll be waiting in front of the studio already. And even after every project's uh, final submission, I would not rest as much as the other students, whilst the rest of the other students would go back to their rooms and like take a rest, take the day off. I would not do that because I was so fearful that if I rest for too long, I'll be left behind. So what do I? So what I do is after I finish the project, I only sleep for the first three or three or four hours. And then I'll wake up, still be in the studio. I'll be cleaning my place up to be ready for the next project, even though the brief ha hasn't come in just yet. So now I am thirsty again. Everything clear so far? Vinci, are you okay? Yes, everything good. Okay, cool. So now comes the gist, the main thing of the talk, which is basically how I tried to change my routine. I think in a way, the sprint the tortoise mindset is still somewhat ingrained in me. I don't work with as much as intensity as I did before, but I think I still practice it. I still practice within that sprint the tortoise mindset with consistency, meaning that I may not be as slow as I was before, but I focused on being consistent day in and day out. So rather than uh, pushing myself to work on a studio project for like 16 hours a day with, with fluctuating uh, productivity. I'd only spend a portion of my portion of my hours to work on the project. And I do it mindfully and consistently over a set period of time. 
So how did I change my routine? And what are the, some of the things that I did differently as I did before? So now I'll go through one by one, the things that I, and hopefully you too, you will choose, will use to change your routine. First and foremost is the 24 hour clock. So at the beginning of any architectural project, you have to understand the available resource or parameters that you're going to be working with. So when you're given the brief, you know that this is the duration of a project. You have a month or two months or maybe even a few weeks. And you're given a set of deliverables that you have to be able to make within this set time period. So in this case, the two most important thing that you have to consider is you, you, no, you, and time, or you in relation to time. And so the way to plot this out is a through a 24 hour clock. So rather than a normal clock, which is only like 12 hours, so you have to go, you have to watch the long needle go to 12 twice. This one uh, is just a way for you to plot out uh, how you spend your time during the day. So uh, what I do is in this chart is I plot out the stuff that I do. So in this case, if you see in from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m., it's actually a time that I spend to sleep. And then for the red red parts are the period that I use to work, which is the golden hours, which I will uh, explore in detail later on. So the 24 hours, it's not exactly a way to save your time. It's actually just a way to diagnose your current situation so that you'll know what, what to change, how to systematically make those changes, and also to record what works and what doesn't. It's just a chart for you to make notes on how to make changes in your life. So to fit our con current context at this very moment right now, I would suggest that we uh, adjust our sleep first. So how do we do that? I call it, I have a knack of naming things. In this case, I, I named it mindful sleep. It's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not an official term. So if you Google it, you're not going to find it because it's not an official term. It's just me wanting to name things because it sounds cool. Even though it's like, it's not even a real term. So I call it the mindful sleep. So according, to Matthew Walker, a neuroscience professor at University of California, he was also famous for his book, Why We Sleep, which I have yet to read, but has seen his TED talk, which is called Sleep is Your Superpower. He said that sleep is a non-negotiable biological necessity. It is your life support system, and it is mother nature's best effort yet at immortality. Thus, in this, in this, in this, in this quote, sleep isn't a thing that you should just do. Because, to me, it should be done uh, intentionally. It should be regulated, and audited for its effectiveness. So, if anything went wrong anywhere, you'll be able to pinpoint it, and make the changes accordingly. So in my case, I divided sleep into three parts. Before, just before, and after. So now let's start with before. So this is for how to sleep, basically. Okay. So there are a few things that you should be make that you should make sure of before you go to bed. First for me is I prepare the clothes that I'm going to be wearing the next morning. And I make sure that my towel is also close enough so that when I'm 
so that when I, when I when I wake up, I'd be able to be I'll be able to reach it straight away. So when you're done with that, uh, we we go to the other parts, which is stop eating and no more screens. So okay, let's say you are planning to sleep at twelve. So that means, so if I know that I'm going to be sleeping at twelve, then I will offset at least one hour before to stop eating and stop looking at screens. So what time is it now? It's nine. So I'll be offsetting my time. If I'll be planning, I'll be, I'm going to be planning to sleep in three hours time. So I'm going to, going to be offsetting an hour before. So maximum, the, the maximum time that I'll be, the, the latest time that I'll be eating is at 11. Okay. That's clear, but I think this one, this 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 eating thing, is uh, quite tricky to counter because for because we're so used because as students, right, we are so used to scrolling through our phones just before we sleep. And and I noticed uh, it, during my pre, like before COVID when we had our when we had physical classes, and during my time in the hostel. I noticed that my friends, they usually have their charger near to their beds. And even if they don't have the charger near their beds, they would have an extension with an extension so that somehow the charger is near to where they're sleeping. And this, this, this using your phone while it's charging is, is, is an entirely different story of bad. And, but the, the consequent effects of you scrolling through your phones is that you're not going to be able to sleep because our brain uh, when we see that light it tells us that it's not nighttime yet so we don't feel like sleeping just yet and the consequent effect of that is that especially for us students when we've been scrolling through our phone like let's say it's 12 and we've been scrolling for our phones for up until two or three somehow we tend to feel hungry again. <laughs> so it adds to the difficulty of uh, sleeping even more. So what do we do is that we get up, we look for food, or back in before pre, before before COVID, we, 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 we call our friends, we, we somehow go to McDonald's uh, because it, it's open for 24 hours, we get McFlurry or for some fries. And then we uh, sleep right after eating, which is, an entirely different story of bad as well. So, how how do you how do you get over this? If you're able to, then I suggest that you charge your phone in a different room than the one that you're sleeping in. So let's say like right now, if you this camera right now, if I'm sleeping in that room, then I should be charging my phone here. However. If that's not possible for whatever reasons, then simply turn off your data or turn off your Wi-Fi before you sleep. This is because this was this will uh, decrease this will, this will lessen the urge of you to check your phone because you know not you know that no notifications be coming in because the Wi-Fi is off, which is uh, will make it easier for you to resist the temptation to look at your phone. Just before. So now you've gone through the next step. You're in bed, but your mind is still wandering around. You're probably thinking about your unfinished studio project for next week's crit, set, crit session. I haven't finished my sketches for next Monday. Well, what do I do? I can't sleep. So what do you do then? This is the time that you have to learn to wind down. For me, it's, it's, it's like let, letting your ideas go to sleep while your body begins its journey to heal. So first off, you have to close all the lights, all the lights in your, in your room. So let's say if you have so if you're charging your phone and your phone does that thing where in the middle of the night suddenly pops up the light 
put your phone, like charge your phone so that it faces down. And sometimes even for the like the backside of the, the, the phone, sometimes it pops up the light. Have a cloth or a book, something to cover your 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 phone. And sometimes your your extension wire as well, the 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 flip switch, it has its its own light. Try to cover that as well. And well yeah, so you did you do the cameras, you do, do the phone stuff, you turn it upside down, cover it. If you have you have the extension, cover that as well. And so now your room is pitch black. Or at least it's somewhat pitch black. Like not not like my room. Like my room, it has my little brother, it's, he changed the curtains to like a very light colored purple. So now the the light from outside outside can be seen kind of through the curtains. So what I do personally for me is that because I don't have those things, you can see what you call a thing to, to cover your eyes. I cover eye cover. Yeah, I think it's called eye cover. So I also whatever. use that sometimes. <laughs> but because I don't have it at home. So what I do is I have, I take my blanket, I wrap it around my head, but just be just up to here. Lah. So you be, you'll be able to breathe. So then your your the the effect is that your you are somewhat sleeping in a pitch black situation. So now you've covered all your phones, covered all the light source, you've covered your your eyes. So now what do you do? So this next this next part is taught by my counseling teacher back in my uh, secondary school. It's actually a breathing exercise that somehow transitions itself into the most satisfying nap you will ever have. But for me, I usually, I usually use it to, to help me to sleep. So what do you do? Is you breathe. This is this, this this is the most important part. What do I do is that I lie on my back. I make sure my hands are on my stomach. Like I I can't really show, but like lay down with my hands on my stomach. And then I have my legs straight. Sometimes I have my legs bent. I don't know why, but whatever whatever it is, make sure you're lying on your back with your hands on your stomach. And then what I do is that I breathe in only through my nose. And when I breathe out only through my mouth, you cannot go, go up through your nose as well. And you make sure to feel the air. So when you breathe in through your nose, make sure your, your hands, the, the, the reason why your hands is on your stomach is that so that when you breathe in, you can feel your stomach going up. Usually what people do is they breathe in and then they go up, they rock, their chest rise up, and that's that's not the proper way of breathing. So what you, what actually you have to do is you breathe in, you make sure your, your stomach that rises. And then uh, it goes up to the maximum level. And then when you breathe out, make sure it, your hands as well, it makes sure that your stomach falls back into its original place. So what I do is that I breathe in for three seconds then I breathe out for another three seconds. Uh, an indicator to know if you're doing this right is that by the third or fifth repetition, if you're already yawning, that means you are breathing properly. This is also mentioned by my biology teacher back in secondary school as well, backed by both teachers. So it's legit, I'm going to drink again. Talking requires a lot of drinking. I did not realize that. So you breathe in for, as I've said before, so breathe in for three seconds, breathe out for three seconds. You do that for a few times. But for me, I do it for like 20 repetition. You count. It, it looks, it looks, it looks, it looks a bit weird on camera now, but like, 
you get the point. Like it, you, you breathe in, make sure your stomach feels it, and then you breathe out. And the trick here is that when you're so focused on the counting part, it takes your mind, it takes the pressure of the desire of wanting to sleep. So you're focused on one thing. So you don't really think about, oh, I have to sleep, I have to sleep because that, that, that's, that's, that's too much pressure, that's too much stress. So you focus on something else and then somehow you sleep. That is, that's, that's the only explanation that I have. You, you, you do that and the next thing you know, you're waking up because you, your, your, your body doesn't even remember the, the counting part and you just sleep. So now comes the next part, the after sleep. Good morning or good night. It's, it's still, it's still at nine for good morning. So if you're just starting out this process, your body, for me, like, uh, when I first started out, my body, it, it woke up at six or around, around eight because I wasn't used to the, 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 the waking up early thing. So for my like Muslim brothers and sisters, you probably have your alarm set for subuh prayers or sometimes for me, my, my, my dad knocks on the door. Hey, solat, solat, solat. Sometimes, sometimes I don't have my, my, my alarm on me. So now the challenging part, which is to get up. So right now you might be thinking at this point of the talk, why are we talking about all this? Why are we talking about uh, sleeping and getting up? Like, isn't all of this obvious? Isn't all of this uh, like obvious? But a, major, a majority of us still have trouble with this. We know that we should do this, but a lot of us are not aware of it. So me being here today is to make sure that you notice of the, all the small details so we become aware of the existence and only then can we hope to fix it. Hopefully, the next time when, you, when you're like tomorrow morning, when you're battling with yourself to get up, your mind will suddenly remember my voice at the back of your mind as I narrate your life towards making a change. Bangun, bangun. So now you, you know, now it, it's this the part where you are getting up. So remember the towel that you uh, have from the night before. Well, your first goal right now is to move your body, not get up, to move your body in such a way that you you'll be able to reach, reach for it and then take it. This one is important because the moment the towel makes contact with your skin, your body will realize shower. That's the first, that's the first gate. So now you use that momentum to channel energy down your legs just enough so that you'll be able to navigate your way to the shower. Now, things can go in one of two ways. The first one, is you get in the shower normally. Or two, like I am, whereby I'm living in a house where I'm not the only person who's using the bathroom. So sometimes the bathroom is occupied. So sometimes when I'm, this, this is a side story, sometimes when I'm too lazy to wake up, what I do is that when I'm lying down, I listen in to my siblings. If, if, if they, if they, uh, like if I hear the bathroom door closing, I'll, I'll quickly get up and be like, "Wah, baru nak masuk," and then uh, so that I have that excuse to like, "Ah, oh, I, I just have, I just have to go back to sleep now," or it's, it's because I have a couch here. Ah, uh, uh, tak boleh masuk tana. Okay, I'll I'll sleep here now. But that's not what you should do. The trick here is, as soon as that happens, if the bathroom is occupied, go downstairs or go wherever the kitchen is 
and at least splash some water onto your face so that your body remembers that it's no longer sleep time. It's because sometimes when, when we sleep, when we dream, we, we can dream of diving in water. We can dream of being beside a pool, but we can never dream of feeling water. Get okay, what I mean? So when, when you have that water on your face, on your skin, your body remembers, okay, I'm awake now. I'm no longer dreaming. So I have to wake up. I have to get up. Okay. So now, so you probably have to wait for the bathroom and then you go shower. Uh, and then the clothes that you prepared the night before, now it's ready for you to wear straight away. So now it's all settled. So usually during this, this time for me, I get a cup of Nestum or Oat or Milo or whatever that you have, at least one cup so that or whatever hot beverage to kickstart your day. So now your morning should become a precedent for the rest of your day because when you've conquered your morning, it gives you this sense of empowerment that you're going to be able to take on the rest of the day. So, ba -ba -da -ba, the golden hours. So now you have learned how to sleep and how to get up. But seriously, a lot of people underestimate the power of mornings and the miracles it can do to change your life. So now I'm going to be telling you about the golden hours and some time-saving ideas for you to use throughout your day. So simply put, the golden hours are specific times of the day that you work best in. So in my case, my golden hours is from seven until 10. So during those times, the work that I do is very productive. So let's say uh, when I was uh, staying up before, I'd, I'd spend around like 12 until five to work on a single thing. But during my golden hours, I'm able to spend half an hour to one hour to do the same work. And during these, during the, during the golden hour time, it's also your most productive. So you should focus on high value tasks so that you, the other tasks, the lower value tasks you can, that you have can be utilized during other time. So during this time, during the golden hours, you have to be a bit greedy with your time because what we do, what sometimes I do as well is that I wake up and straight away I check my phone and that should not be the case because the first few hours of our life when we wake up should be ours. We should not be uh, the thing that we have in the morning when as soon as we wake up should not be bombarded by all, of the, by all of these notifications. It should be for ourselves first. We have to be greedy, protect that energy. So you have to use it for yourself. Use it for the things that are the most important to you. And only then you start working for the world. And this one will require some trial and error, this, this discovery process. Because, but to even, to have a, to, to even have time for trial and error, you have to be awake to have that time for trial and error. But when you do find the golden hour, you can start composing your life or composing your schedule around those hours. So that way you can start filling all the other times with your other works and commitments. So in my case, I've identified that my golden hours are during seven until 10. So all of the other management works like uh, managing my business, managing all the other stuff, I can put that into all of the other times, but not my during my golden time. So, so far about golden hour 
Vinci, you okay? You cool? Yep, everything is good. Okay, I'm gonna drink now. I think it's quite good to have the golden hour thing that you can actually plan your time well. Yeah. I actually discovered this back in semester four. And the thing with this hour is that it works so well for me that during that time for portfolio review, I finished my boards and my models. And during that time, it was a final, final exam week as well. I was able to answer my exams. I was able to study, uh, answer my exams well, finish a week early my models and my boards before my portfolio review. And I, I didn't use I didn't use the whole day to to do my work. I only used the the three golden hours for 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 the weeks for the days during during those weeks. So for me, it, it's it's a very powerful tool to to use. So now, so this next one is called uh, structure over skin, or content over cover. So this one is to be used when you're stuck as to what to do during, what to do first during a project. Say, let's, 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 let's give an example. Let's work with an example. Say you have a work due on Monday. So today is Saturday, but you spend today, the whole of today with your family. And tonight you're hearing this talk. You're here right now hearing this talk. So that means you only have tomorrow the whole day to work on your project for that is due on Monday. So how do you start? Or better yet, how what do you start with first? Let's let's go with the same example, okay? Let's say on Monday you have an interim crit. That that's the one that you get marks for, you know? and you're supposed to present your um, floor plans, your sections, your elevations, and you have to re compile all that in a pre-recorded video before nine thirty a.m. If you've already finished the requirements, then great, congratulations! You may proceed with making all pretty and polished for a presentation. But what if after this talk? After this talk, you are still figuring out what space should I put in my floor plans? I don't know, where's my tango, where's my stairs? I don't know, travel distance. Uh, I don't know. How. So how, what do you do then? So in this limited time, you have to prioritize the structure over the skin. So the important integral parts as opposed to the visual, aesthetically pleasing part of the presentation. So as much as you, as you would like to make it all colorful and have all these hand-drawn sketches here and there for effect, you have, to, like it or not, you have to first and foremost comply with the requirements. You can have the most complex and beautiful facade in the whole wild world. But if your building fails to stand on its own, then what is the point? So again, this is obvious, but a lot of us still fall under this trap. We think we can do both at the same time, but the fact of the matter is we're better off single tasking, one by one. Focus your time and energy to first complete the structure and only afterwards do you set up the skin. So now this next one is brought up to my attention by a lecturer of mine. Uh, he's called uh, Dr. Azizi, but he insists on, he insisted to be called Chit Gigi. He taught my studio subject back in semester four. So basically what he taught me was to start with paper first. He emphasized the importance of sketching. So keep in mind, this was during semester four. So during this time, we had already ditched 
the manual stuff and already went to digital. So to me, this, like when you said to start with paper, this seemed to me, this seemed counterintuitive to me because the way I thought about it, like since we're doing digital now, would it be faster if you straight away work with computer? And I, at first I thought it was, I thought he was a bit anti digital, but like soon after I applied it myself, I realized the meaning behind it. So what is the meaning behind starting with paper? So as we all know, our study studio projects revolves around doing and thinking. You sketch out an idea and then you edit your design to test it out. And if it doesn't work, you go back to sketching again. It is a constant back and forth process of ideation and iteration. So ideation should be done using our hands with pen on, on paper. This is because there is no barrier between our ideas from our brains to our hands that's doing the sketch. I forgot who said this, but this, this there, but there is no interface in between our ideas. So as opposed to using a computer where you have to press a button or choose a tool just to draw a simple line with your hands, the ideas flow seamlessly. So you're able to talk as you sketch, as you think, because on paper, is where the problems are solved. So uh, in my case, I would like to share how I usually do my sketches. So I firmly believe how the way you sketch is the way you think. So the way I sketch is that I would first uh, have a research, not a research, I have a question that I'm trying to solve. And then I'll try to fill that page up with a lot of sketches that I think would solve that issue. And then I'll choose one of the sketches from that page to expand on the other page. And then I'll choose one from this page to be expanded on the next page. And then after I've get and only after I've gotten about four pages of full sketches, I can look up and zoom out and look at the sketches on the whole again. And if I like what I see, and only then do I go to the computer to test out my design. So when you do, do it this way, you won't be spending a large portion of your time wasted in front of the screen, pressing buttons to figure out this and that and that, when, when you could have been easily been done using your hands on paper. Now, last but not least, is to take a break. I'm gonna drink first. Well, I haven't drinking a lot during this time. So, taking a break. This one is largely overlooked by a lot of us because as architecture students, we like to go on for long hours during work to test our strength and endurance as architecture students. But I think the most relevant reason is that we think it will take us the whole eight hours to do this specific work. But, it, in, but in fact, we could also do it in two hour chunks with short breaks in between. So stand up once in a while, walk around, read a book on other stuff. Uh, I saw this, uh, if you guys watch this YouTube channel called uh, 30 by 40 Design Workshop, uh, he was talking about taking a break. He, he called taking a break as the incubation period. It's whereby uh, the uh, the problems, the issues that you have in your mind that, that you're trying to solve, your subconscious is solving those problems while you're taking a break. So for him, it's taking a hike, it's 
walking around because he lived in a uh, an area where it's very foresty and very rocky so he would walk around the he would take a hike uh, go on a walk so that while he's doing all of those things his subconscious mind is solving those issues that he's been, been has that he's been actively trying to solve during his studio time so that's where the eureka ah uh, aha moment arrives because your your subconscious is doing that that solving for you so take a break so and we might not and we might not like to hear this but our tension like it or not slowly declines over pro prolonged hours of work so i think you have to rest recharge and then continue your work again. I think it's better that we work with a constant 75% tank within two hours, two hours, two hours, rather than working with 100% over eight hour period of time and then, but it slows, it slowly goes down to zero. So those are the ways to save the time so now during this process of change i have personally gone sev have i have undergone several mindset changes and these changes come within different phases of change throughout this whole process so the first phase is the excited phase so this is the part where you just starting out. You want to make that change. And for me, this, this will run for a few days up to a week. And by then your body starts to feel like it's going to fall back into its old routine. So during this phase, it's very important that you manage your expectations because change will not, will not occur overnight. You have to be able to take time through the process. This is a long-term commitment. For me, this, this excited phase uh, came from a friend of mine. I'm not sure if I should mention his name. So basically, basically he, uh, he started his journey as well. He would wake up at 4 a.m. every day to follow. For, for him, I, I, I looked up to him because he would Whenever he would find free books, he would read them. And whenever uh, an online teacher or online guru, Sifu, would, would offer up a, a free class, he would, also, he would always attend them. So I had always admired the way that he is able to take up that much knowledge in a short period of time. So I wanted this kind of change for myself as well. But... I did not foresee the cost that I have to uh, go through to for this for to be able to reach where he's at. So this excited phase, this is the phase where I was uh, uh, well excited to make that change, but my body because I was I was not used to waking up early and all that my body starts to feel like, um, should I, should I wake up? Should I, but like the first few, the first few days, it's, you're excited to change, but like after a few days, like up to a week, your body's like, um, should I, should I do it? So now you go back. So now you go to the, what am I doing phase? You start to think, ah, should I do this? And this part is slightly harder to, to, to quantify because for me it took it took it lasted a couple of months this is the part where you start noticing what morning feels like and how long it actually is for a period of my life like before this I did not know what mornings feel like because I would usually wake up by the time at noon 
and I would I, I don't realize how 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 mornings actually how mornings actually how long mornings actually are. Sorry, my English. Dah 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 lama ni jadi tersasul. So by this time, my 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 I realized that mornings is actually taking a long time. And so this is also the period where I realized that my mind and my body began to fight back because let's face it on a Saturday morning sleeping in is so good but who would wake up to do work who would wake up early on a Saturday morning to work it feels so good to sleep back in and this is also the period where some of the methods that I'm trying to do doesn't work for whatever reason so this so this is the time where I, so during the, the previous, previous phase, my goal was just to wake up early. But during this phase, my goal was just to be able to not fall back asleep until, until 10 or 12. And this to me become tiring because I did not see the reason why. I stayed up, I, I, I woke up at 10 no i woke up at 6 and stayed up until 10 without doing anything and i didn't have that purpose so during that time i had this this like this moments of me feeling like giving up with this whole changing thing but i think the thing that kept me going above all else of above all else is having a reason why. During this period as well, I started reading this book. Uh, it's called Start With Why, I'm not sure if you know, by Simon Sinek. So in this book, he talks about having a why that propels you forward. So I think that, and it, it, it's, it's, it's ingrained into my belief as well that that we can have time and means, but it won't propel us forward towards the direction that we want without why. You know, because a why, a reason why makes this non-ending tunnel a little bit easier. So, so I look back on the why I started this journey in the first place. Why did I want to change it all? Because it all came back to the existential questions I had at the start. Like this version of me, do I like him? Like honestly, starting out this journey, I wasn't too fond of myself. Not because of how I look, not because of the physical reasons or anything like that. It's more towards the way I'm letting time pass, time passed by me as if I'm going to be having it forever. And I have this tendency to dwell on the past so much so that the presence get so the present gets ignored. So if I so past conversation, past relationships, past occurrences, I keep on replaying it again and again and again in my mind so much so that the thing in front of me gets ignored like my family, my health, my, my exercise, my, my work, I tend to dwell a lot on the past. And this version of me right now, do I like him? Well, I can be better. I want it to be better. And there's also the question of, will I spend the rest of my life like this? So I was, at that point, I was letting myself be, be affected by everything around me. So I was more reactive than proactive. So I spent too much time working with almost no results. And for what? Like I can spend hours, you know, days on end in front of the screen. And, and yet when my family, when my family asked me for a weekend with them, it, it's, it's too hard for me. I 
I need to get my priorities back in order. And I think the, 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 the last existential question was that I asked myself was, is this it? I know that if I do this, there's more than this, if I do things differently. At one point I was living a life where I would get sad for no person for no reason for no apparent reason so i'd spend a lot of days like feeling sorry for myself uh, for having nothing done i haven't done any work so i feel sorry for myself but at the same time i feel too lazy to even try uh, i stay up late i get up late no works get done i feel guilty and then i feel like i need to do more work so i spend more time doing spend more time to do work to make up for it and it's cycle repeats and this 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 guilty cycle repeats i do the same thing and i feel the same thing so to me this change is my hope to do things differently so that i can feel differently so i think my reason like finding those lost hours is not merely trying to recover a last lost time because time can never be recovered you can only strive to make the best of what you have now and hope for best for the future i think finding lost those lost hours ultimately is well finding me so i think that's all from me. So you have any questions or any comments or anything like that, you can direct it to Vinci or write in the comments or in, if you're in the live, you can write it there. Yep, so thank you, Nashmi, for the wonderful and very rich sharing. I hope everyone enjoy it as well and gain a lot of information and knowledge. So now let us proceed to our Q&A session. If there's any comment, any question from you all, you all can just type it down in the comment section and we will be attending it on. So I have a question from me, Nashmi. Oh, okay. So, um, I know that you are the logo designer of Masa. So can you like explain more on the concept? This is slightly off topic, but I'll, but I'll explain anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the Masa logo, uh, back then I had the Because the, the, the brief for the Masa logo was to, for me, uh, the thing that I saw during the brief was that uh, you need to have a design that's memorable and to be able to try something new. So this is, this is just for everyone's information as well. Um, when, when I, whenever I'm, des I, I design logos for a living as well. So whenever I design my, my, my logos, I have this intention in mind that it could it, sh it should be able to perform in different platforms meaning that uh, it should be able to be printed on a phone it should be able to print on a sticker it should be able to be sized up as big as a billboard for example so whenever i did a logo it would it needs to be applicable to different sorts of platform and my principle when designing logos is to be versatile, to be able to be painted on all those, and to be clean, specifically to have clean logos. But during this specific brief, I felt like maybe I should try something else. I, I went directly against my principle, which is to have clean logos by having a textured logo. So the idea behind the, 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 the Masa logo is that I wanted to convey time 
as you can see, I have, I have the Marcel logo in the background here. Coincidentally, so I wanted to know, I wanted to show how time would be represented in a visual, like visually, how, how, how would you represent time? Like if it, if it was a literal design, it would be a clock or a watch or just a, what do you call it? Hourglass. But to me, what inspired me was that time could be represented in the way things change. So I imagine like these stones, if you would, I forgot the place in America where the where there's rocks. I forgot what's, what's the place called? Grand Canyon. Ah, yes, that's it. So Grand Canyon. So the way the rocks are uh, 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 eroded by time and the way it's formed again. So I wanted to show that in the logo by having the, it's like pillars of rocks being eroded by the time, by sand, by wind, so that I can represent time, which is basically massa. So that's the answer to that question. Yeah, it's cool. I think the way you think about it is quite thoughtful. And then you actually think about how you play with the um, expression of massa itself. Okay, so there's another question from the floor. From your introduction, you have a logo studio, right? So how do you plan to do so much activity and your academic at the same time? Okay, this one, you should you should be you should understand first why are you doing all these different activities during academic times so for me i didn't want to graduate architect i didn't want to graduate at architecture with only the with, with only having the option of architecture so you have to in this point you have to have the bigger picture in mind after you graduate what do you want to be do you still want to pursue architecture do you do you want to pursue business? Do you, or are you good at talking? Would you like to be a speaker? Would you like to be what? You, or what would you like to be do, uh, during or uh, after graduating? So for me, I wanted to uh, somehow pursue business as well. So during uh, my academic years, well now as well, I would uh, join the programs uh, organized by the. Uh, center of entrepreneurial i forgot the long name but like the the one for upm they, they organize all these entrepreneurship programs i would enter that even though uh you would be doing cl not class are doing uh, in during weekends or during uh in between class times because i wanted that opportunity uh, that opportunity that opportunity of myself after graduating and also you could the, the main the, the, the main thing is that you know why you uh, do those activities in the first place because when you know why you want to do those activities you'll find the time to do it so even for me for for another situation is that uh, back in first year uh, for in order for us to be uh, entitled for college the next for second year we have to collect parents so for me, I knew that I need to have lots of merits lah for the next for, for for to enter college. But I don't have any, I don't have a lot of time. So what I do is I only target the the events that have high merits. So for me, I know I'm able to speak. So I only target public speaking competitions, and I know that public public speaking competitions usually don't have a lot of participants. So regardless of how I do, I always get third place. So like when you have this in mind, you know, when you have this kind of strategy, you, you'll be able to, okay, uh, you won't, because when you are there to win, let's say you go for a competition and you know there's many comp competitors, you, of course you'll be having a lot of preparation and that preparation will, might uh, might uh, clash with your with your academic times but if you know there's competitions that don't have much participants then join those competitions 
because you don't you won't need uh, you won't need uh, a lot of preparation before that, and at the same time, you know you get lots of merits before because of that. So I think the most important reason of one of the way or actually the how of the how the way to divide your time it's it becomes it falls naturally the moment you know why you do it so i think that's the i think the most accurate answer to that question yeah i agree with what you say okay there's another question from hakin ahmad he mentioned that well it's a interesting roller coaster journey and his question is that have you ever take advantage to do design development while you are asleep this is a question that I still <laughs> that admittedly that I uh, un not accidentally lah, but like I would sometimes unintentionally do. Uh, what I do is that I know that the because I've seen the, the 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 thirty by forty design workshop. We talks about the incubation period. So what I do is that I know that my subconscious will help me to solve those problems. So what I do before, if I feel like, oh, I'm going to be sleeping next, but I, I feel like taking a nap. So before I take a nap, I look at, I first, I understand what's my issue. What, it, what, is, what, is, the design, what is the design issue that I'm trying to solve? So I look at all of the stimuli, I look at all the pictures, I read all of the articles pertaining to that issue so that eventually when I fall asleep, the somehow the, the the inner workings the subconscious mind will somehow connect the dots so that when i wake up it's like oh i have the solution straight away so basically if you want to use your sleep to solve your problem just before you sleep feed yourself with all of those questions okay i want to do this i want to solve this i want to solve that so i had to read this article this article this article feed yourself with all of those inputs so that your subconscious mind will be able to connect the dots when you're asleep so that when you wake up, you have the solution. So that's, that's what I do. So that is quite interesting. Okay, so there's no question from the floor. Thank you so much, Nasmi. Thank you for giving us an interesting and eye-opening sharing, as well as the motivation and advices, especially for the students and also young architects. Well, this marked the end of our talk today. Thank you everyone for joining us on today's online sharing session. And thank you so much to Nashmi for sharing his idea. Well, I hope everyone of you enjoy it and gain a lot from him. So do keep in touch and follow us on Masa Instagram and Facebook for more updates. And until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll catch you next time. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.